I'm so excited to be your host. Um, I am Danielle Perez. I am a she, her. I'm an Afro-Latina, brown skin, long, curly black, big hair. I'm wearing a hot pink dress with long sleeves. And um, I'm so excited to host this panel. Um, this panel is really about the intersection of disability in entertainment and climate activism. And we have amazing, amazing panelists. I'm so excited to bring our first one out. You guys, please make a warm welcome for Daphne Frias. Hey, Daphne. Hey, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So excited to be here. Thank you for being here. Can you give us a, a visual description of and intro yourself? My name is Daphne Frias. I use she, her pronouns. I am wearing a yellow dress with some gold sandals. I use a motorized wheelchair. I have a short brown pixie cut and some pink glasses. And they're gorgeous. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Our next panelist is Kat Keeley Wells. Please welcome. Hi, Kat. Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So pleased to be here. Can you give us a visual description and your pronouns, please? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, my name is Keely, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a white woman with longish blonde hair. I am wearing a black skirt suit, and I am in my mid to late 20s. Ooh, look, she's brave. She's giving us her an age description as well. Uh, for those asking, um, millennial masquerading as Gen Z for me. Uh, <laughs> our next speaker that I'd like to introduce is uh, Stephanie. Oh, no, wait. Oh, yes. Uh, Stephanie uh, no, no, Nogueras. I'm so sorry. Stephanie Nogueras. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. So great to have you today. Can you give us a visual description and your pronouns, please? One moment for the mic. Hello, everyone. Sure, I can definitely do that. I'm wearing a green a blazer with a necklace of a moon. Represents my daughter named Luna. Uh, I have a beach wavy kind of uh, pantsuit on. I'm a Latin female. My pronouns are she and her. Wonderful, so wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next panelist is David Radcliffe. Hi David, so great to have you here. Good to see you. Can you give us a visual description and your pronouns, please? Hi, my name is David Radcliffe, he, him, his. Um, I'm a white man in a wheelchair, a blue manual wheelchair that's been through some stuff. Uh, I'm wearing a uh, checkered uh, beige and white long sleeve shirt and dark pants. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm so excited to have this conversation because honestly, I'm disabled. I am an actor, writer, comedian, and, oh, I'm sorry. Oh my God, wait, oh no, no, the, oh my gosh. Now I, wow, you guys, I, tr <laughs> this, this is, this is, I made a boo-boo, I made a mistake. I'm missing one of the panelists. <laughs> and we can't start the panel without all the panelists here. So I want you guys to make it very, very warm. Very, very warm. For Natalie Trevon. Natalie, thank you so much for being here. You, last but not least, in the middle, the prime location. Um, can you please give us a visual description and your pronouns? Yes, thank you so much. So my pronouns are she and her. 
and I'm an African-American woman with brown skin and blue-gray eyes and uh, mid-length dark hair. I have on a two-piece vest suit, which is actually my own design. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Okay. Okay, one more time for all of our panelists. Um, I am I am very excited to um, to moderate this panel. Um, I'm an actor. I'm a writer. I'm a stand-up comedian, and um, I honestly don't think a ton about the intersection of my disability and working in entertainment and environmental activism. And so I'm really excited to learn from all of these amazing panelists today. Um, and I, I, thank you guys for being here and being part of this conversation with us. So Daphne, I wanted to start with you um, okay so you've created uh, an amazing career for yourself um, as an advocate at the intersections of many activist movements um, can you share some of the intersections that you highlight um, that intersect between climate and disability of course well first before I start Danny I want to say thank you for giving my last name some flavor I never get introduced <laughs> properly so thank you for that um, and before I keep going I just want to say you know that land acknowledgement was so powerful I think that as a climate activist I cannot do this work without the protection, dedication, and ferocity of our indigenous communities they continue to protect us when we have not protected them and I think that that is critical to remember. And in the climate movement right now, we're seeing a spark of Gen Z activism, which I'm so honored to be a part of, but we didn't originate this work and we will not be the ones to end this work. And we stand on the shoulders of these indigenous communities in order to be able to do this amazing work that we do as a community. So thank you. To answer your question, um, I began my activism journey about six years ago, shortly after the tragedy in Parkland. Uh, I began working in the gun violence prevention movement simply because I didn't see stories like mine being told. I uh, am born and raised in West Harlem in New York City, a beautiful, vibrant community of mostly immigrants. And growing up, I experienced fluctuations of gun violence my whole life. but as I was growing up and going into college, I quickly realized that although we were experiencing gun violence at a disproportionate levels, our stories weren't making the news. And your socioeconomic status and your zip code doesn't determine your quality of life or if your story should be told. And I knew that I needed to change that. And as a disabled Latina, I knew that coming from communities of color, it is taboo to see disability as something to be proud of. And I wanted to change that. So working on the intersections of gun violence, disability justice, and the climate crisis, people are like, what do all those things have to do with each other? They're radically different movements. And I say, actually, they're not. Girl, speak on it. Tell us. So <laughs> I am currently getting my MD, MPH. I'm in the third year of med school, and I have six months left of my master's. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. So what I'd like to tell everyone is that advocacy is public health. To be a doctor is to be the fiercest advocate that you can be for your patient. If I am not going into rooms with my future patients and understanding all of who they are, their cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds, I am not seeing them and I will not be able to treat them properly. So. To be an activist is to already be the best future medical professional I can be. And to be a doctor is to understand how the quality of our earth is going to impact the quality of our livelihoods and our physical bodies. I'm also coming to you here uh, three months after beating stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and as a climate activist, it's been a reckoning to understand how my very job for the past six years has also contributed to having to face my own mortality, right? And this year-long journey of contemplating these issues have helped me to realize one thing. 
the power of your voice is indispensable. For the last nine months, when I couldn't use my voice and I couldn't use my physical body to show up for my community, I had to reevaluate how I showed up, right? So much of how I defined myself was by being the loudest person in the room. But when I couldn't be loud, how was I still able to make noise? So I had to ask myself, is my community ready to lift me up? And they absolutely were. They were there every step and every turn of the way. And I think that this is what we can learn from the disability community. We are innately resilient. We are innately loving and proud of how our bodies show up in this world. And we need our narratives in Hollywood to show that. We need to inject joy into climate advocacy, inject joy into disability justice, because joy is the only way forward. And I hope that when you leave this panel today, you remember that, that the narratives around climate can often perpetuate climate doomism, and our media love to sensationalize the realities of the climate crisis. Yes, they are dire, but there's also hope. And once we lose sight of hope, we are in a dangerous situation. So please hold on to that hope. Please hold on to that joy because it'll take us so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daphne. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing uh, just the journey that you've been on and the call to joy. I love that. Um, I know that uh, the ladies that put together this summit also emphasize joy. And I, you know, I, no spoilers, but, and just like that is out. And <laughs> there is, um, you know, Miranda, she's always trying her best. And <laughs> <laughs> they depict some environmental activists and it's it's we're not bummers uh <laughs> we want the world to be better and um and we can do that joyfully we can do that having fun and and thank you for just reinforcing that message um David, uh, the next question is for you. Um, you said that um, the COVID pandemic was almost a rehearsal for the climate crisis. Can you expand on that? I can, but I don't want to be the bummer in the, in the <laughs> no, after, no, after, after, we, after all that joy. We're um, on both sides, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it is. It's a complicated issue. I think, you know, um, so I'll speak from my own experience. I have cerebral palsy. And initially, um, when we were first hearing about COVID and learning about it, a friend of mine who is an epidemiologist who is deaf um, shared with me information so that she said, I don't want to see you get uh, like trampled at a, at a supermarket trying to get all your uh, groceries together. But here are some things you're going to need. So I went and bought all this rice like everybody else. Uh, but, um, but I tried sharing information with my family and some of my family members who are um, apolitical, I suppose, although I think it's difficult to be that now, um, didn't take my uh, thoughts as seriously as I had hoped. And what that sort of indicated to me was, even if you share with someone, I have a disability, and you've known me all my life, and you love me, and this potential uh, uh, pandemic is a particular threat to folks like me and folks on this panel. Um, and then you get sort of an indifferent response, or they think you're uh, reaction is, is too extreme, too political, whatever. Uh, that is a bit of a bummer. And so it makes me think about where our climate future is leading because if disabled people are so easily left behind and written off, even by some of our own family members and loved ones um, during this rehearsal process of COVID, then one can imagine uh, where the extremities of climate change may take us. And so at the time when, when, um, when COVID began, I also didn't have a car. And um, now I do. And so, but during that time, I was using a lot of public transportation. And in, a, in the event of an emergency, um, you know, you want to make sure that things are, are, are there to help you. And oftentimes, in my role at the Guild, I'm the co chair of the Disabled Writers Committee. And we talk about how huge the disability demographic is and how it's so massively underrepresented on screen and behind the scenes. And sometimes the response you get is if this community is so huge, why don't we see more of? more disabled folks in, in real life. And sometimes my, I mean, it's, it's very systemic, right? Like we don't, we don't usually have panels like this. This is what diversity looks like for real. Um, but, but there are also economic realities. So when I was using public transportation, there were a lot of disabled people using the subway 
So sometimes we are literally underground because we cannot, because we don't have the economic resources to be above ground with the rest of you. Um, and so these kind of realities hit me from all directions during COVID and it makes me think things might not be so great, but I'm trying to hold on to joy and <laughs> take Daphne's advice. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that. <laughs> I need some tips, guys. <laughs> For everyone, I guess, um, how how do we make sure that disabled people are part of the conversation um, in preparing for the climate crisis? Does can, anyone want to jump in I on that I can take one? this one. Oh, Natalie? So um, I work for a consulting agency called Levant Consulting, Inc., and we do a, a lot of disability inclusion consulting, and one of our biggest things is accessibility. And I think a big part of making sure the disability community is incorporated into the conversation is making sure that the information is accessible. And so what I mean by that is, are thing, does things have cart captioning? Are there ASL interpreting for videos? Or is there audio description on videos on information about climate change? Or when we're thinking about websites, do the websites have alt text for images? Are the buttons and links labeled on the website? Can you go through it? independently with a screen reader if you're blind and low vision? And unfortunately, the answer is usually no. And so it's how do we bring people with disabilities into the conversation from the beginning? Like when we're preparing for these things, when we're building these things, to say, hey, what are the things that we need to do to make sure this is access accessible for everyone? And the simple answer is hire disabled people, experts from the disabled community, and don't just ask them for their expertise for the free, because a lot of times we get that. <laughs> it's like pay disabled people for their um, experience and expertise, but making sure that you start with them. A lot of times people like to speak on our behalf, and it's hard to say what someone else needs when you don't have that actual lived experience. And so I really want to congratulate um, the uh, producers of this event for making sure we were part of the conversation from the beginning to the end. That is so thoughtful and thank you. Um, okay, uh, how can narratives around climate be more inclusive? I'd love to jump in on this one. Yes. So I, um, I founded a company called Sea Talent, which is a talent agency and represents disabled talent. I became disabled when I was 17 and chronically ill, and I didn't see myself reflected in, on the screen. I have a complex condition, and I always remember when I got on the bus one day and I really needed to sit down, and I was like, I am disabled, I need to sit down, and I got told, you don't look disabled. Like, you're fine, you don't look disabled, you don't look sick, you're making it up, you're taking advantage of the system. And then when I came to the US, I ended up losing a job due to disability discrimination after I disclosed my disability and the access requirements that I needed. And since representing so many incredible disabled talent at Sea Talent, and our company was actually acquired uh, last year by, by Wayla, but watching the narratives that are on screen, I mean, we hardly ever see anything around climate on our screens. But I remember the one time that I did see something around climate change, it was, um, it was someone who was showing how they could put all of their plastic and all of their rubbish, or trash, as you Americans say, into <laughs> one container in a, in a long period of time. And for me, I heavily rely on a lot of medical devices and have an ostomy, which is primarily made up of uh, plastic. And I was like, wow, I'm a burden on, on the world and on society because I can't fit all of my waste into one small container. So I think how I, I would love to see more narratives around how we can all do different things to change the world. I don't think there's one linear direction in which we all have to take to, to make change. There are so many different things that we can all do, and I would love to see that perspective, because disabled people are needed in this world. Disability is a natural part of the human experience, and I think also going back to the joy and the pride, I think something that I would love for maybe disabled people in the audience to feel is you can be proud of being disabled, but still have a complicated relationship with your medical conditions, and it's taken me a long time to learn, and especially because of the representation that we've seen on screen. 
Yes, I, yeah, I definitely, like I hear what you're saying about having a, a complicated <laughs> relationship with your disability. It, um, you know, it makes us who we are and, but we're often fed this narrative that if you want to help the climate, you've got to get rid of straws. And it, that, you know, we all know <laughs> that doesn't work for a lot of disabled people. But this idea, you know, um, you'll see online people shaming for pre cut vegetables and things like that, or getting everything delivered. And it's like those things allow me to participate in society and showing up in society, I'm allowed to do work that highlights right the importance of the climate crisis or um just show up for the world in a in a better place and so um i i, I, I thank you for add. just oh i'm sorry can i add something oh, to you sure yeah yes. i just yes. wanted to add uh, you were talking about how including individuals with disabilities uh, in terms of emergencies and climate change and recently uh, covid just happened uh, at the very beginning, I think it was around March, uh, we've all lost track of time at this point, but uh, with the, the pandemic had just started and I remember I was driving, I was teaching a session, I was driving home and I had looked out and I saw an extremely long line at a grocery store and I, I felt I had an intuitive thought that something is not right. So I pulled over, I looked at my phone and I was able to see a news story about this national emergency going on. And I felt so out of it because I was the last individual to actually know what was going on. And that's typically the case when it comes to the deaf community. We're the last to actually learn of what's going on. And that can cause a lot of mental strain, a lot of anxiety. Uh, when things are, are distributed, it's, it's not typically in a standardized fashion. So it would be really great to have that equal access so that we're all on the same page and not left out. If something else were to happen, a natural disaster, having a system in place where all people have access is really important so that we feel comfortable and aware of what's going on. So just that's something to think about. I, I think to, to bounce off that too, people associate disability, uh, non-disabled non people, or as I like to say, pre-disabled people. Yes, uh, speak uh, on uh, that. As, associate Good. disability with charity or, or inspiration or isolation. And a lot of that comes from what Stephanie is outlining, is like the isolation that's associated with disability has more to do with the environment in which we find ourselves and less to do with the disability itself. So if you have, and I would like to second that this event has been really well put together, very thoughtfully and intentionally, so that the sense of isolation is lessened because our needs, which are human needs and basic needs of communication and mobility and access, are met and thought of and, and we are integrated into that process. So then it becomes more freeing and we can do our best work and be of value to the space that we're, we're lucky to be a part of. Um, and so. When people think about my cerebral palsy as a limitation, that's not the limitation. <laughs> the limitation is a staircase. The limitation is, you know, um, dangerous in inclines. Uh, the limitation is a gate where there doesn't need to be a gate, uh, sometimes figuratively or literally. So, um, you know, that's I'm agreeing with you <laughs> 100 percent. Yeah. And I just want to add that everyone has access needs, right? Like, I think we think of accommodations for people with disabilities as something that's super expensive or extra, but everyone has an access need. Like if you just think of the example of if I couldn't drink regular milk, right, and I asked for almond milk, you just accommodate me, right? But is it a big deal? No, and that's the same way we have to look at everyone's access needs. It's literally things that just help them to have a better quality of life, but it's not always this like, extra thing, like you don't have to hop on a spaceship and go to Venus and come back and deliver the access need. Like it's literally <laughs> just a simple thing that it's, it's thinking creative and thinking of different ways to help somebody experience and in the same way as the people around them. Daphne, yeah, I just wanna jump in and echo um, what all the other panelists have been saying. I, you know, Two weeks ago, New York City, where I'm from, had the worst air quality in the world, right? I woke up and it looked like Mars outside. And last time I checked, I'm not Elon Musk, so I'm not on Mars. 
<laughs> so, not, and I don't want to be either. So, <laughs> um, just want to clarify that. Yeah. And um, it was, I was hit with the pang of climate anxiety. The whole day, I was tossing and turning for two reasons. One, because our earth was hurting. I could physically feel the pain and the density that our planet was struggling to breathe. But also, I was bombarded with uh, DMs across my social media from people being like, I followed you for years, but I didn't really believe in the climate crisis, and now it looks like Mars outside, so what am I supposed to do? And... Uh, they, did they know who they were following? <laughs> right. I was like, so have you actually been following, or were you just creeping? They had you on mute, girl! Exactly! <laughs> and I mean, like, I got a lot of things to say, so that was pretty offensive. Um, so, you know... One, it's not, it's not the disability or any minorities community to educate people. We already have to expend our trauma enough to just be listened to. So I ignored most of those messages because the internet is free. Um, <laughs> but as a climate activist and as a future doctor, my nature is to want to help people. So I did answer some of these messages and it was, you know, I have to be honest, I'm a little bit petty. So it was hard not to be like, I told you so. It's kind of late. <laughs> but, you know, I put that in my back pocket and I was like, let me just calm myself down a little bit. And I answered some of these messages and I was like, well, this is the reality of the climate crisis. It is not tomorrow or a week from now or a year from now. It is right now. Actually, it is yesterday because we are so much farther from our 1.5 degrees Celsius targets than we've ever been. And that is terrifying. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, please look it up because it'll terrify you too. And I think it's important to, no, I don't wanna purposely terrify you, but it's important to turn that anxiety into action, right? And what I told people in my messages is like, you are now on the front lines of the climate crisis. If you've never thought of yourself as part of this movement, which I don't know how because we all live on this one earth, right? Um, you are now. And when the sky's clear and you're out there in your bougie picnics in Central Park, forgetting that it looked like Mars a couple months ago, <laughs> I'm not here to promote climate amnesia. You must remember that because it's going to keep happening over and over and over unless we do something about it. And something that really struck me during that time was our city's doctor came on and he was like, yeah, turn on your air purifiers and all of these gadgets to clean your air. Disabled people live in systemic poverty. How are we gonna afford air purifiers? My friend, who I love her very much. She sent me $50 on Venmo, and she's like, get out of the city, go somewhere. $50 is not gonna get me nowhere. Girl, that can't get you to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> but it was this thought of the fact that she thought I could just get up and go, right? I don't have that ability as a disabled woman. I live in a city, and I live in a system that does not want me to thrive or seek safety. So, this is the reality, and I, we need to have stories like this in our media. When we talk about the climate crisis, I don't want to see people trying to calculate their carbon footprint or reduce, reuse, recycle. That was literally 25 years ago, guys. It's 2023. There's, we need to like ban fossil fuels and a bunch of other really important stuff. Um, I want to see people struggling to grapple with the realities of the climate crisis because we need to be moved by human stories in order to make action happen. And I think it, you might be like, well, that's the antithesis of joy. And 
it actually isn't because when we see humanity and when we see ourselves in stories, it sparks that joy and it helps us move forward. And unless our narratives are showing that in media and all of our streaming platforms and movies, we're not going to get there. Yeah. I did want to also add just one thing. When I was traveling in Asia, I was really impressed. They had so many uh, television shows and news channels that had interpreters on, on their channel just automatically. Even if it wasn't an emergency, I thought, wow, that is such a great way to provide access to the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, and it's great for parents as well who have hearing children to be able to see what their children are accessing in terms of television or news and that that information is freely shared and it's not something that's pushed aside. It's a great way that families can feel protected and, and fully informed. And I think as well, I mean, I'm so grateful for creators like you and for creators on this panel who share their activism on social media and just share their stories on social media because unfortunately with Hollywood, we haven't seen these stories. And for the first time ever, we have been able to have access to those stories because of social media. Social media still comes with its issues, don't get me wrong, including ableist algorithms, but that's for a whole nother panel. But it is amazing to finally see creators have been disrupting the narrative because we haven't had access to Hollywood. And I hope and I think we are getting to a point where we are now seeing these stories translated to the, on the big screens in an accessible format. And I also want to see stories that aren't just about people being affected by climate change, but who are affecting climate change. People who are taking the issues into their own hands, like the people we were just talking about who, after Hurricane Sandy, they, they took on the city of New York and made, made sure that there were policies that protected disabled people and were able to get, get access to accessible shelters. I want to see those stories. Right. I think, um, um, well, first of all, I do too, for sure. Um, and the challenge, I think, becomes that people think, as they often do with the environment and climate change, that disability, just the the representation of disability, just the existence of disability on TV or in a TV episode is political in and of itself, is activism in and of itself, is different enough. And so the, the notes that you sometimes get if you try to introduce a disabled character or a disabled story is still very much like the 1990s, like very special episode um, idea of, you know, well, if we have a disabled character in this, or if we address climate change in this particular thing, then that's what the episode becomes about, right? Which is ridiculous, because, because so many of us just live our lives, you know, like anyone else. You're going to Starbucks because you want a cup of, well, I'm not promoting Starbucks necessarily. <laughs> you're going to a coffee shop because you want a cup of coffee, not because you're a disabled person who wants a cup of coffee. But within the framework of television, if we have to answer the question, why is that disabled person there? <laughs> How do they feel about their disability? What, if, you know, what, what is their trauma that we can explore? And that is really boring. And I think if we start to steer disability and climate change both together or independently as just a feature of a story rather than the story itself, then we have come a long way. But um, the, you know, we're still in baby steps mode on some of that stuff. Totally agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that as well. I think people think that you know, disability is just part, like that's our, own, that's our personality. I'm just blind. So when I get like character breakdowns for like, if somebody asks me to come out on audition, that's literally the breakdown blind woman so okay like what about this blind woman like I think people forget that like we're these complex beautiful creatures with all different types of identities right I'm not just a blind woman I'm also an African-American woman I'm a sister some of us are mothers some of us are lovers like I can still put on a piece of lingerie and feel sexy and go out on a date and do all these different things like I don't have to just be sitting in my house feeling sorry for myself and I don't do that I'm like Daphne like I'm a little spicy like I can get petty like sometimes I don't like things and I voice them and I'm just not like in most days I'm choosing joy 
because that's what life's about, finding the things that you really enjoy, finding the things that you love and getting excited about them. I love designing, like, and people ask me all the time, why would a blind per person care about fashion? Because I want to look cute, duh. Like, <laughs> why else? Like, just like you, like, I want to be a part, like, I'm a fashion girly and I love things like that. And so I think we need to see that on television, that we have multiple identities and we can do these multiple things. And I think once we start there, then we'll start to see more characters like Daphne. I want to see a character like Daphne who cares about the climate. And that's really funny. Like that to me is something worth watching than our usual same, you know, kind of storylines that we get. And so I'm hoping that's where Hollywood is moving towards. David, after the writers get what they want, we're pitching Daphne. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for sharing that. I had an audition recently, um, woman in wheelchair, glamorous role. Uh, in the rain, um, running from a, a natural disaster and then a first responder rescues her. <laughs> and I was just like, I... I <laughs> In, it, it was just, it was hilarious to me, um, but it was just really wild that, um, that they wanted to shoot a commercial where a person in a wheelchair in a natural disaster is not somehow, like, that just all of a sudden a, a first responder is going to come and fix it all. Like, I don't know anything about the company or what they were trying to do with this commercial, but it's like, I don't see disabled people pictured in natural disasters, in environmental stories. It's like, I, I want to see stories that actually show that. And um, you can't just like wave a wand and pretend like, oh, and this is, you know, when there's an emergency situation, there's a fire, don't use the elevator. I don't, I, a lot of people ask me, they're like, what happens? I'm like, I don't know, I guess we'll find out when there's a fire. Uh, <laughs> but um, a, a big misconception is that accessibility is financially just too much. It's a burden, we can't do this. Um, and so I really wanted to speak to all of you um, how, I mean, it's a huge misconception, but how, um, for the dummies who run the industry, how do we explain to them that um, making sets accessible and sustainable is a net savings? <laughs> I, I just want to quickly uh, add to this and pitch that um, I try to remind people that it's actually um, beneficial to have ramps around because crews use ramps. <laughs> yes. So, um, I mean, it, I, I have a, a friend, Caitlin Young, who um, runs a company called Alpha Studios, and she uses a big motorized chair. She works in post-production. She does amazing work. You should check her out. Um, and so they need ramps for her around the sets. And what they found was that this, and Ka Caitlin can, can fact check me, or, or you can check the videos out with her, is that they ended up saving two hours of time on, on a given shoot day when they set the ramps up. So I don't even like using the word accommodation because that puts the mm -hmm. disabled person in the, in the feeling as we so often do that like we are a, a, a special need, we have special <laughs> needs. These aren't special needs, These are just, this is just baseline stuff. Do I want to be able to communicate with my peers? Yes. Do I want to be able to get in and out of a building? Yes. And so do all of you. So it's not special, it's just a need. And so a lot of times what people find is that when, once those things are thought of in advance, and hopefully not retroactively, once, once you build it, uh, we, we will come. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we will do good work and maybe save you time and energy um, and create a more interesting product. I'd love to add just a, a quick tip onto that. I completely agree. I think accommodations is a frustrating term. And if you, I, when you're starting a meeting, when you're sending out an email and to organize an event, if you can just ask everyone, don't assume, ask everyone, do you have any access requirements? It will change the game for so many people. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say that to David's point, 
accessibility benefits everyone. Yeah. Accessibility isn't only for disabled people. How many people took the elevator to get here to this theater right now? That's an access requirement, right? Um, and this reminds me of a story. I when I was younger, I used to do, I, I used to act, and one of the times I was on set, you know, you gotta hit crafties in between in between shots, and I was. I went to craft services and it was on this massively high bar table. How am I supposed to get food between shoots and between scenes and nourish myself? And, you know, immediately like five or six PAs went over like, how can we help you? And I was like, I really just like don't want help. I want to be able to get it myself. Because like, what if I want one of everything on the table? I'm gonna have you stand there for 10 minutes picking <laughs> every single flavor of cheese because I deserve all the cheese? No, I wanna be able to access it myself. Um, I also think that s such as we have implemented intimacy coordinators, we need access coordinators on set. We, um, like um, we mentioned on this panel, nothing about us without us. Don't assume our access needs. Don't assume how to be disability positive. Hire us to do it because we are the experts. Um, and I think that the more we can have roles like that on set, not only is it going to help disabled actors and other people in the media, as uh, David mentioned, our pre-disabled peers will also feel comfortable enough to speak up about their own needs on set, and it will foster a community where everyone feels nurtured and protected while they're making beautiful art. And I think that that is vital because oftentimes in the media, we can have such a transactional process, right? Where you go in, you film something and then it's like, okay, on to the next audition. And you're striving and you're you're struggling and you're, you're you're struggling and you're hustling, but really fostering those um, those bonds of community are what are vital. Yeah, and I would say that access needs a lot of times just takes creativity, right? And Hollywood is supposed to be a creative space, but it seems like they lack the creativity sometimes when it comes to just providing basic things. I remember one time I was on a set and we literally got some paint sticks from Home Depot, less than their dollars, taped them on the ground. And that's how all the blind folks knew where to stand and walk. And it, it took like five minutes for them to put them down. And then somebody that was not, not disabled, they didn't have a, a sight issue, they were like, oh, well, this helps me meet my mark. I can barely meet my mark. So it was like, it was helping everyone, you know? It wasn't a thing where, you know, it, ha it had to be like this over the top thing. So I think it's just thinking how to do things differently in a creative way. And I would really hope that uh, the uh, city of creativity <laughs> would be um, more ready to, to jump into that, to their creative juices and think of other ways to make things more accessible. This has been such an amazing conversation, add. and um, we're almost out of time. Wait, um, yes, yeah, yes. can I add something? Of course, yes. Just to add to what Natalie was saying in term of, terms of access on set and how it benefits everyone, um, including the crew. I've been acting for several years now, and I've noticed what's common on set is when you get to set, the crew will always ask me, uh, or they're pretty timid at first, and they'll say, how do you sign high? And I just wave. <laughs> I just wave, you know, it's a simple sign. And they, they're relieved right away. But really just relaxing and understanding that initial fear, that can start a conversation and really break the ice. Just wave high or bye. It's t totally okay. And it gives them that piece of, okay, everything is okay. And I try to make sure that they know Feel free to ask me any questions just to make sure that they're comfortable and know that the communication access isn't an issue at all. But typically that first day is where people are a little bit awkward in the beginning, but it just want to make it easy on that person and make sure that there's an open line of communication where they know they can ask. So it's nice that first day, those jitters that typically people have after you're shooting for a couple of days, things lighten up, but 
And they'll ask more about, hey, what's the sign for this or what's the sign for that? Mm -hmm. Or ask, is it is ASL International uh, or, or things like that? But again, it's really nice to have that access and teach a little bit of sign lang language when you're on set, especially if the interpreter is not uh, right at, at accessible. And yeah. a lot of the crew actually knows this sign, which is the sign for rolling. Oh. And it's funny, as soon as they know it, they all start doing it at the same time. So it's like, no, we only need it from about one person. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so they'll learn rolling. They know the sign for cut. So, but it's really great to, that that uh, the crew on set is eager to learn some of the sign. But again, having just one person sign it is enough. But it is nice to have that access for for everyone on set. And I think it's important to know that um, things are gonna you're gonna get things wrong, um, and and so are each of us because not you know I only have my disability, so I certainly learn from conversations like this and. Recently, you know, I, I won't say exactly what event, but um, we, we were trying to put together some uh, um, accommodations, trying to advocate for accommodations of, of a wide variety of things. And at the, at the end of the event, I came back and, and let some of the organizers know that the accommodations weren't totally up to snuff. Uh, and the response was essentially, well, we tried, you know. like. Yes, I saw that. Like, I understand that. That's wonderful. That effort should be made. But I want to emphasize that the response to, hey, hey, we could use a little bit more, the, the unhelpful response is we tried. Because that makes us feel like, as we so often do already, that we are some kind of burden. When we really just want to be as involved and as contributory and as enthusiastic about the thing that you just enjoyed with, with the benefit of your sight and hearing and ability to walk. Um, which is all temporary, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let us help you, help, help us help you, help us. <laughs> to, to wrap up this conversation, I, I do want to bring it back to Joy, and I would love if each of you could share um, media that is getting it right or that you're really enjoying right now in terms of disability and environmentalism. I can jump in. It's not specifically about the climate crisis, but yesterday we had an amazing keynote that featured Quinta Brunson, and I want to um, highlight what she did in her uh, season two opener episode of Abbott Elementary. There was uh, there were two students with disabilities in that episode. One student was in a wheelchair and needed a um, a desk to be able to uh, roll under in order to attend class. And there was another student that was deaf. And one of the teachers over this uh, break had learned ASL. And he was trying to encourage the other teachers in that school to also pick up some of the sign language. And they were hesitant at first. They were like, well, you know, they're not my student. Um, you know, it's not necessarily important. And over the course of the episode, you see this teacher being able to communicate with this student and how much it made them feel safe in this school. And then uh, for the student with the physical disability, at the, uh, at the end, after trying every single resource, they were finally able to get an accessible desk. And it was the first time that I was able to see a story that actually represented the struggles I faced as a student. And I spent the episode laughing and crying. And I ran to my mom at the end, and I was like, Mom, we have to stream this episode, because she was busy cooking. And she was like, I don't have time to watch TV. And uh, I was like, no, Mom, it's really, really important that we sit down and watch this episode. So I watched the episode back with her. And she was like, you know what's really powerful about that episode for me? that the teachers took initiative to help their students because so many of our caregivers have to carry the burden of advocating for us in spaces where we're not welcome. And I think Quinta and her team did such an excellent job of capturing all the nuances that come with disability. And across social media, I immediately went on social media and looked up all the comments on this episode. And so many of our peers and siblings in the disabled community felt the same way that I did. And 
the only thing that made me sad is that most of us had waited 20 plus years to finally see someone like us, folks like us on the screen, representing a storyline that included us. Um, I also think it's important to remember that when we talk about disability and climate, it is an ongoing process as the climate crisis continues to intensify. We must not let communities be left behind. Um, you know, just a couple of days ago, there I was telling um, Keely that there was a hailstorm in Colorado that dropped golf size pieces of hail for like the span of 10 minutes and there was some flash flooding and it was over an amphitheater and over 70 people got injured including about 10 people with physical disabilities right and all of the people with disabilities at the event were more injured than able-bodied folks because the ambulances that were available to them could not accommodate their physical access needs in order to get them to the hospital and it was incredibly disheartening to me because again, we are a community on the front lines, but we are often relegated to the sidelines. And I don't wanna be on the sidelines anymore. I mean, I don't think I have a sideline personality. You do not have sideline energy, girl. <laughs> front and center. So, I mean, I wanna just be rolling and living with joy. I mean, I put my neon green uh, wheelchair sides here for you guys to give you some good energy. <laughs> I want, I want that energy to be seen and heard and shown. Um, and I think it's also important to highlight where things are being done well, um, because I think a lot on this panel we talked about all the things that need to change, but there's also so many good things that are happening, um, and. I think the thing that I really just want to leave you all with is that we, this is the most diverse panel I've ever been on in terms of disability and other identities, right? And I don't want that to be the case anymore. I, you know, there's this saying where it's like, we want to see at the table. And I was like, nope. I mean, I already have my own seat, so <laughs> I already got the seat, right? That's great. But I don't want seats at the table anymore. I want auditoriums. I want stadiums. I want arenas. I want the biggest things and the biggest rooms we can imagine full of us. Um, and I also want every one of you here to become uncomfortable because at the when we are uncomfortable is when change happens. And I want you all to get used to not seeing yourselves in, in rooms all the time. And this mostly for our white peers, to be honest. Because I wanna be able to come into rooms and be in spaces where people look like me and come full of identities that I identify with. And oftentimes that might mean that the people who are on the front lines now don't get to be on the front lines anymore. And I'm like, that's okay because you've been taking up all the space anyway. It's time for you to relax a little bit. Um, so be uncomfortable, open up your, open up your range of where you're willing to step into, because once you step into that area of discomfort, yeah, it might not be fun in the beginning, but I promise you'll find some amazing things along the way. I want to see more, there, there are so many powerful disabled people, but those powerful disabled people are often not given positions of power in society and on our screens. I want to see powerful disabled people highlighted, having platforms in stadiums, on our screens, and I want to see disabled people both in front and behind the camera. That's where we're going to get the, the diverse stories and the authentic stories. And I want to see disabled people not necessarily just working on films or TV shows or storylines that just revolve around disability in all stories. Um, in terms of representation and what is good and what I'm watching, I mean, I always now gravitate towards the social media creators because I feel like they're the only ones right now that are really 
on top of it, and um, and they're truly disrupting the narrative. So I'm just I'm following some amazing disabled creators on social media. Shout out to Amani. <laughs> Amani Barbarin. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Crutches and Spice. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, I haven't seen in media yet some really great representations of blindness, but I I would agree with Keely that there are some great influencers on social media like Lachi and Katarina, who's the blindest Latina, but I also wanna shout out Anna Smith, who put together the first ever all blind runway show in New York City. I got to participate and do runway for the first time and it was amazing. And she made sure it was accessible. There are paint sticks on the ground. You could walk with your dog or your cane or an escort and everything was so well executed. And it was an opportunity for the fashion industry to see how different types of models can be elevated and everyone looked so beautiful and the designers were so great in working with people who are blind and low vision and that's what I would love to see more within the entertainment industry across the board. I remember when I was young, I was the only deaf person in my family and I always felt Often, I should say, I felt left out. Um, and speaking up would result in my family saying, oh, you complain too much. And that was a cycle that went on for the rest of my life. And I was simply trying to express how I felt, my voice. And having that repetitive denial, negative reaction, really affected my mental health. And it's not often that I was able to have that expression of love in my family. And I didn't see that as a, a role model anywhere that I looked even outside of my family. I found my joy in nature, feeling the warmth of the sun on my skin, being out in the forest, taking a hike, going to the beach. That's where I found my joy and found my connection I honestly feel more connected to animals and people, I will say. Um, but, you know, I, I felt that I was on the same level with nature as opposed to my family who was, in essence, pushing me aside because of that communication barrier. And we see that in society as well. People with disabilities, individuals who don't have a disability, shun them or push them to the side. And we typically will express ourselves more often on social media. So I'm noticing that uh, more awareness is being raised and people may have that same reaction of, oh, well, you're just complaining on social media, but it's really not. It's a space where you're able to actually express yourself without that judgment. Um, and it can also be pretty time consuming as well as suck your energy at the same time. So I try to be balanced in that terms to make sure to reconnect and recharge with nature uh, and then get back to, to the real world. But balance for me is key. Be around individuals that recharge me and give me joy. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm in the Writers Guild. There are only 0.6% of Writers Guild members who openly identify as having a disability, um, in part because they know that this bias, some of which we've talked about today, exists. So I've had private conversations with executives who say to me, hey, off the record, I have XYZ condition. Do you think I should disclose it? And I say, as someone with an obvious <laughs> visible disability that I cannot choose whether or not to disclose, I say, yeah, like that'd be very helpful <laughs> to all of us. And it would change the, the content. Um, it, would, it would open up more opportunities on crews and on sets if people could be their fullest selves at all times. But I also recognize the industry as it is. And so it takes some courage to be your fullest self uh, for some folks. Um, and I think that's why we have so few examples of great narrative-driven disability content that's authentically cast. Um, I'd also say that, as a disabled writer, I've been on a I've been on a few shows now, and I'm still a staff writer, which is the lowest rung of the ladder, which is part of the Writers Guild fight. A lot of people, a lot of people from underrepresented communities, end up repeating the staff writer position. So imagine doing your same entry level job three times, where you really don't have, unless you're very lucky, you don't have a lot of voice. That's why some of the narratives don't change. 
most writers' rooms, I think 98% of writers' rooms do not have an upper level disabled writer. And those are the folks that make the decisions. So that's another reason why we have so few content, uh, so little content that we can cite. I would say that this organization has less budget and less uh, uh, longevity so far, because it's only like, what, four years old? And has, <laughs> and has been more attuned to disability being part of the conversation than most larger organizations with bigger budgets, who usually tell us, like, we're putting this together at the last minute, um, we don't have the time, or, you know, oh, that's a really interesting thought, I haven't thought of that, we'll do that next year. Um, and so what this is proving to me is that media and media-related events are possible uh, to be built in a truly diverse, inclusive way, um, regardless of budget, regardless of time constraint. So I'd love to see, I'd love to see and participate in more of that. Um, I'd also quickly mention that one challenge we have within the Guild is that because disability is not often considered as a diversity lens, even diversity and inclusion programs um, steer towards non-disabled uh, <laughs> versions of ourselves. Um, and so that's a problem, because then the industry just kind of steers towards those that can hear and walk and see, um, and so that also impacts inclusion. And so instead, what we're often asked to do is be consultants. So for $400 or so, we will pay you to come tell us your life story, and then we will use one of our other writers who does not have your disability to tell that story. And that doesn't go towards our, if we're in the guild, that doesn't go towards my health insurance. That doesn't give me a credit for my next job so I can get out of the staff writer bubble and, and move up the ranks. So the consulting space is kind of dicey. So I was very fortunate to work on a show, an animated show that's, uh, I, I, can't, I think I can say what it is. Yeah, it's out already. It's called Pupstruction. There's a dog in the show that has wheels in the back. And they wanted to do a really inclusive, accessibility-driven story, which I'd never seen before in kids' programming, preschool-level programming. And instead of hiring me as a consultant, they said, no, we met this actual writer, <laughs> disabled writer. They exist. Uh, we met one that we enjoy. We'd love to have him in the room. So I got to write an episode. Um, and I'm excited for my three-year-old niece to see it, because she has questions about my wheelchair and accessibility, and I'm sure that some of you do as well. So you can watch uh, Pubstruction. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ha leave one more note about, uh, specifically in the climate space. Um, as a Gen Z activist, Gen Z has a pretty good BS radar. Like, we just, we just don't want the fluffy stuff. Like, just... We know what's really going on here. You do vibe checks. Yeah, the, vi <laughs> oh, the vibes, the vibe checks be failing all the time. Um, and I think when we talk about climate narratives in media, we want to see stories that give agency to climate anxiety. We want to see stories that give agency to how the climate affects our health. We want to ha see stories that talk about intergenerational climate communication because we cannot do this work by ourselves. Uh, I, I think it's also important that we highlight that it's one planet and one goal, right? Your billions of dollars is gonna burn in the fire <laughs> if we don't fix the climate crisis. It's not gonna protect you. Um, and also, it's the reason why we're here in the first place, but that's another conversation. <laughs> um, and I think we want narratives that have substance. We, we don't want another Armageddon or tsunami disaster movie. We want stories that really show the heart of the climate crisis. Um, and I just also think that we should, before we end, we should, give our socials and just highlight ourselves one more time because hire us, right? We're all here. We're all amazing. Um, and not to take over your Oh, no. Movie. You're killing it, girl. <laughs> um, but listen, guys, I was in my bed for nine months straight and not being able to do anything. So I got a lot of energy. <laughs> um, and yeah, so hire us. We want to be there. We want to uplift our communities because our community is vibrant, amazing, and we deserve to be heard. So please, please just 
remember all the things we told you here today. Continue to uplift us. And I'm, I've just been so honored to be here with everyone. Um, please feel free to follow me on my socials, which is Frias underscore Daphne. Um, I've already followed all these amazing panelists. And in the last week since we've been connected, I've learned so much from each of them. So I know you will as well. Kat, where can people follow you? Uh, so I'm on social media as Keely Cat Wells, and I've also just started my new company, which is Zeta, Z-E-T-T-A, which is all around accessible education and enabling entertainment to create inclusive talent pipelines, uh, and also a media company called Making Space Media. And we have a really exciting announcement coming out in the next couple of weeks, so definitely follow that. Stay tuned. Natalie, where can people follow you? Yeah, so I'm on, I'm Natalie Trevon on everything, and then I'm currently building up my brand, uh, social media, which is NYI, not your inspiration. Disabled people are not your inspiration. Um, and that's at where nigh on everything. So yeah, those are my social media handles. Stephanie, where can people follow you? You can find me on Instagram with my full names, uh, at Stephanie Nogueras. Simple enough, and yeah, you can find me on Instagram, and then when you're there, you'll find my website as well, and I'm also opening uh, a production company called Pepita, uh, or I opened it, excuse me, last year, and it's really a, a space out there for the Latina, Latin community uh, in this entertainment space. It's a safe space where we can support one another. I know it's very hard to find a support system in this industry, um, so it's a space to provide that, and if you have have projects um, and mentors are available there as well. So excited about that. Thank you so much. David, where can people follow you? I feel like I have to start a company. <laughs> uh, but I'm just, I'm just a dude. Uh, I, my, my, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as my name. It's David uh, Radcliffe, not Daniel. I, I've, got some, I've gotten some tweets that are clearly directed for the other guy. Uh, <laughs> My name's David Radcliffe. There's no E on the end of my last name. It's R-A-D-C-L-I-F-F. -F. Um, I've been Danielle Perez, and uh, you can follow me at Diva Deluxe on Instagram and Twitter. There is no E at the end of that. Yes, that was my screen name from AOL. Uh, <laughs> one more time for this amazing panel. I've learned so much from you all and enjoyed sharing this space. Thank you. Thank you.